Jack Ray Hemby was a 76-year-old from Rio Doso Downs, New Mexico. He was a father and horse trainer. On November 9, 2011, Jack received calls from a few friends, but his phone activity ceased that afternoon. A month later, Jack's car was found at a local casino. He was never seen again. I'm Ed Denzel, and this is Unfound. What does that number represent? At least for the purposes of this introduction, that's the percentage of marriages that have infidelity occur in them. To break it down farther, 25% of men have admitted to cheating on their spouses, and 15% of women have admitted the same. But don't brag too much, ladies. Studies have shown you're gradually catching up to us men. Why does this happen? Well, divorcemag.com yes, that's a real website, lists the following reasons. The internet, running away from problems, pornography, escort services, Facebook, boredom, growing apart, addiction, not married for the right reasons, lack of respect, feeling unappreciated, issues involving body image and aging, insecurity, living apart for extended periods of time. Hearing that list, I gotta say, it's amazing the percentage is only 20. I bring this up because today you're going to hear a lot about infidelity. Jack Hemby, at the time of his disappearance, had been cheating on his wife for almost 20 years. Yes, really. And quite a few people around him knew it. Yet his wife was seemingly in the dark about what Jack had been doing. The task for us today will be to figure out what happened to Jack. And if it had anything to do with the state. Of the affair. And now, a summary of the case. This is brought to you by my friend Megan Good's website, charlieproject.org. Jack Hemby might not have been very good at relationships, but he certainly was great with horses. As a trainer, Jack got many into the winner's circle, and he possessed many trophies and pictures and memorabilia to prove it. However, Jack's luck at the track changed. He suffered an injury which didn't allow him to train the thoroughbreds anymore. Eventually, he used horse racing as an excuse to be away from his wife Donna, when he was really with his longtime mistress, Mary Gillett. So on November 9, 2011, Jack was at home receiving calls from friends as he usually did. And that afternoon, Jack used his phone for the last time, getting a call from Mary. She claimed she then came home and the two got into a fight. Jack took off in his Volkswagen Rabbit, and Mary claims she never saw him again. She saw no reason to report him missing because Mary knew Jack was married and she believed he had gone back to his wife Donna. However, that didn't occur. Jack's rabbit was found in the parking lot of a local casino a month later. He was never seen again. The main issue with this case is no one officially reported Jack missing until his car was found. Once the investigation began, though, the following questions popped up and they are still not answered all these years later. Number one, why did Mary claim Jack left on November 15th when Jack's cell phone records stopped on November 9th? Number two, could corruption at the racetrack in Rio Doso Downs, something Jack spoke out against, be the cause of his disappearance? And number three, how did Jack's wife Donna really not know he was spending a lot of time with another woman for almost 20 years? A fact Donna claims she didn't know until told about it after Jack disappeared. Jack's family believes Mary knows more than she has said. However, they realize that Jack's behavior and words could have generated many enemies. The guest for this episode is Jack's daughter, Shelley Webb. Unfound News If you were a guest of a case that appears in Volume 5 of Season 1, or are currently a Patreon member at the $20 a month level, 
you should be receiving or have already received your personally signed copy of that book. I hope you like it, and I hope the book can further the publicizing of these cases. Next, speaking of which, transcribers for that volume will be receiving their copy soon. In fact, transcribers for both Volume 5 and 6 should have received their PayPal payments last weekend, in addition to an email with links to all of the Patreon blogs going back to August 2017. If you are a recent transcriber, please verify that you got them. Finally, I hope everyone had a great Mother's Day. This was the first one without my ma. I got through it pretty well. But the lyrics from Flying High Again by Ozzy Osbourne did come to mind. Mama's gonna worry. I've been a bad, bad boy. No use saying sorry. It's something that I enjoy. Where you can find Unfound. Unfound supports accounts on Podomatic, iTunes, Stitcher, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. On Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, please join us on YouTube for the Unfound live show. Contribute to Unfound at patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast. This week I need to thank Laura, Galen, Ashley, and Miranda. You can also contribute at PayPal, unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. That is also the email address. Merchandise, books at amazon.com in both ebook and print form. Don't forget the reviews. Shirts at myshopify.com. Cards at makeplayingcards.com. And please mention Unfound at all true crime websites and forums. Thank you. A note before this interview starts. Much like when we cover the disappearances of drug users, drug dealers, and criminals, I want to remind you that we're not making any judgments about Jack Hemby's behavior. We are only talking about his infidelity because it could be an element of his disappearance. I'm so fortunate to have on this episode of Unfound the daughter of Jack Hemby, Shelley Webb. Shelley, welcome to Unfound. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for joining me and the listeners. Let's start here. Let's talk about your father a little bit. What do you remember about him as, uh, as his daughter, as a child? What are some of those things that uh, come to your mind? Well, my dad was uh, always gone a lot of my childhood and my sister's childhood. He worked at a town a lot, and uh, when he was home, he was still busy working. Uh, we used to fish together. We all used to go fishing together and hunting and camping. And then as we, uh, as I got older, he seemed to be more distant from his family. Hmm. He stayed he stayed gone a lot with jobs or he would take jobs that kept him out of town or mm -hmm. stuff like that. So as I was growing up, as I got older, I didn't see him as often. Okay. And does he have any other children besides uh it is uh we should know that uh your mother and he did get divorced at some point and he got remarried. Uh, again, that's gonna be part of mm -hmm. Um, what we're going to be talking about today. But did he have any other children uh, with your mother besides you? Yeah, I have three three sisters. Okay, wow. You had all daughters from your mother. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. And where do, you, where do you fall in line with that? I'm the oldest. The oldest. Okay. I'm and oldest and please. Um. Uh, I'm the oldest, and my youngest sister uh, didn't come along till after my mom remarried my dad, and we moved to Wyoming. Wow. Okay. And she got pregnant when I was like 16. <laughs> oh, okay. So okay. We're we're a few years apart. Yeah, that's that's the way it is in my family too. My brothers and my sister are almost 20 years older than I am, so I can understand that. So he was always working. Uh, he was kind of out of the house, so it was you and your sisters and your mother there in Rio Doso, Rio Doso Downs, New Mexico. Is that where you grew up? No. Okay. Where? No. my We grew up in Artesia, New Artesia. Mexico, where I live. Okay. That's where you live now. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then my mom and dad divorced when I was 
I will say 13, 12, round in there. And he moved to uh, Wyoming, Casper. Mm. And so we stayed here. And my mom worked at the A&W. And so we stayed here. And then within a couple years after that, he talked her into going to Wyoming. We all went on a vacation, went to Yellowstone and enjoyed the vacation. And then he talked my mom into moving and remarrying. So then we moved to Wyoming when I was, when I was in seventh grade, something else, 14, 13, 14. Hmm. So your parents got divorced and then they got remarried? Yes. Wow. Okay. That's unique. Uh Okay. And then, so I, uh, so we went to high school and graduated from Casper, Wyoming, except for my uh, youngest two sisters. After my mom and dad divorced uh, again, she uh, moved back to Artesia and uh, bought a hamburger we called it a hamburger place. They served all kinds of stuff. But she bought that and huh. raised my two youngest sisters in Artesia. So she, your mother was running her and own my, business? Yes. Wow. And my dad stayed in uh, Casper for a while, and then I think he moved to another part of Wyoming, and then he traveled to Colorado and with horses, he just kind of, after he, he didn't always do that. But after he started training, he was always going to different states. Once he started training horses, and let's talk about his horse business. What He, he was a trainer, so of course we just had the Kentucky Derby uh, a week ago. And so he would train horses to race? Yes, in Rio Dosa, he trained horses in a, little town right out of El Paso, Texas. He also owned a couple racehorses of his own. Hmm. And then he trained in um, Albuquerque, New Mexico. He used to train in Colorado, but he finally just more or less stayed in New Mexico. Okay. And so he finally, at some point after, like you're saying, he was in Casper and some other places. He eventually, though, did come back to New Mexico. Yes. And Pretty when much. He, while we were in Casper, my dad, he uh, was a, a drywall and painter. Okay. Him and another man went into business of their own, and they had their own uh, drywall painting company. And what year would you say that uh, your mother and father got divorced the second time? What year do you think that was? 44 years ago. All right. So, okay. So 44, that would be, I'm 48. So like roughly 1975? Mm, Yes. That sounds about right. Okay. So they got divorced in 1975 for the second time? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. And, but, um, did he get remarried right away? Uh, of course we do know about Donna that we're going to be talking about, but my understanding, they didn't get married until like the early 1990s. Were there any other women in that time? Uh, yes, he, the reason him and my mom got a divorce is he was seeing another woman, (laughs) Uh uh, that, that uh, didn't live right in Casper, but she lived in another town that he had met when he was working. It was in Rock Springs. And uh, he met her there, and I guess he had it was having an affair with her. Uh, I'm not sure how long that went on before my mom found out. And then she kicked my dad out. Right. But he was seeing this lady for quite a while and he had a son with her Hmm. and then after that then my mom when my mom found out she kicked him out and divorced him and Mm -hmm. I think he dated this lady for probably four years after that and then they split up 
Okay. And he moved to New Mexico. Okay, so he moved back to where you were. Mm hmm Okay. And then my dad moved in with another lady here. Uh, she ran a motel. And uh, he moved in with her, and they were probably together for a few years. I'm not, I, I really can't remember how long it was, three or four years. Ago. And uh, she bought, she opened up a place where dad could train horses here. They called it the horse hotel. And she put up the money for him to do all that. And then they finally split up. Then he moved, then he went to Colorado. So he moved all over the place. He was in Wyoming, he went back to New Mexico, he went to Colorado, mm -hmm. and a variety of women after your mother, of course, the second time around with your mother. And, uh, he but went he, around her. <laughs> yeah, he got, he got around a little bit. And the, and the listeners, of yeah, course, um, his uh, relationships with women, I think, is going to play a, a big part. Uh, of this interview so uh, I think yeah. we're setting that up right now and I appreciate you uh, Shelly being very honest about it I appreciate that because yeah, I know that I it's probably not I was a child <laughs> yeah that's not e it's probably not easy for you to talk about especially since no. he was doing it you know to you did it to your mother at one time mm -hmm. how let's move up to this though you know, he was in the horse business how did he end up meeting Donna who ended up uh, I guess was his next marriage, it was a while you had some relationships. Was that the next marriage after your mother the second time? Yes, he met Donna in Colorado while he was racing. Uh, I don't know if it's Colorado Springs or exactly what town in Colorado it was. Uh, they met, she was a waitress at a at a restaurant that him and the other guys frequented. And uh, I guess he asked her out and they went out and seemed to click and so she started uh you know hanging out with him at the races and going places with him and then he brought her to new mexico to meet um us and his mother and then they got married after he brought her down to new mexico okay what'd you think of donna uh i liked her she was uh real sweet kind of a timid at first she she's real sweet and uh she um didn't uh drive so she had to depend on people a lot i guess she was in a bad wreck she had told me and it scared her so she just never wanted to drive anymore hmm. but she was nice to us and friendly uh and she uh my dad's mother which was my grandma, she um, was sick and she started having, uh, you know, where she'd forget things and stuff. And then she had a brain tumor, but they couldn't uh, take care of it. So she got worse. So dad and Donna were living in a little house behind my grandma's house. But she, they always had this other house. So dad and Donna lived in that house and Donna and two other women would take turns taking care of my grandma. Hmm. So not too long after she, her and dad married, maybe a year after that, she was kind of a caretaker for my grandma Okay. with two other women. And uh, then my, uh, probably a couple years of that. And then my grandma finally passed away. Okay. And then her and uh, dad stayed in the back house for a little while. But she was very friendly, still is. We just don't visit very much. But and we're, we're estimating, and and we're estimating they got married somewhere around ninety two, ninety three, ninety four, somewhere in there. Uh, the way you remember it. Yes. Okay. They, got, they, they had to have gotten married, and I'm, I'm thinking in 1989. Oh, okay. Uh, sometime in there, because she got pregnant, and 
I'm thinking back in, I don't know, I'm thinking in 89. So they had to have gotten married maybe in 87, 86. All right, so it's uh, back in the 80s then that she got married. I know when yeah. we had talked before, we were thinking, you were thinking early 90s, but you've kind of, it sounds to me like you've maybe thought about yeah, it a little bit more. I, yes, I did. I found out information on my brother's, when his birthday is and stuff and things like that. So okay. they were married before she got pregnant. <laughs> okay, so, and they had a child together. Like you said, he's your half-brother. Um, and yes. so he was born in what year? He'll be 30 in June. All right, so 1989. Yeah. Okay. Um, but it's, when we had talked before, though, it sounds like your father's marriage to Donna was very much like his marriage to your mother, that he w didn't spend, he wasn't around a lot. Like you said, when you were a child, your father yeah. was not around. He was not around Donna a lot. No, he wasn't. At first, before she got pregnant, they were, he wasn't here much, but she would go with him to the races or wherever he went. She would go with him and travel with him. So they would be together at the races or the uh, areas that he went. And when he was training, then she would come home, but she always, he would come get her. Let's say if he was in Rio Dosa, she... He would come get her, mm -hmm. and she would go with him the places. And then after she got pregnant, which she, my dad told me he didn't want any more kids, and he didn't, um, when he got with her, she had told him she couldn't have any more kids. So she ends up pregnant, and I think my dad was upset about that. And then when she got pregnant, she, and had Justin, she just, kind of quit going anywhere with dad hmm. that baby was her life okay so he got where he wouldn't uh, come home much except on christmas and he would only stay a day or two and he would li he was living in the tack room at a at the racetrack and donna would buy she bought help buy him stuff so he could do a car or you know he had places to stay he would stay in the tech room at first, and then she would go visit him if she got a ride up to Rio Dosa or El Paso or wherever he was at. But then she she got where she didn't even really care too much. She just wanted mm -hmm. to raise her son. So the Rio Dosa racetrack was how far from their house? From where I live, from where we live here, it's an hour and 45 minutes. All right. So he was living an hour and 45 minutes away from his wife, staying there. Mm-hmm. Okay. And when he was staying in close to El Paso, a town right out of El Paso, that was about probably three and a half hours away. Yeah, it's, that's, that's a totally different state. Right. Okay. So he's staying at the track an hour and 45 minutes away because of his work. And of course, you knew about. I, I'm, I'm guessing you had a relationship with him it, to some degree, and you just kind of accepted that. Donna kind of accepted that. Your other sisters, who might have had some relation, kind of relationship with your father, accepted that. Did that ever seem kind of strange to you? And we'll get into the next part. But at the time, from when they got married up until the 2000s, did any of that ever seem any seem strange to you at all? Yes. He okay. was never home, and and uh, when he would come home for the holidays, uh, we had to go over there to see him. I can remember one time he came to my house to see me and my husband and my kids. Every, we always went to him. Mm -hmm. uh, my my oldest daughter had we had Christmas one year at her house, and Dad came down from Rio Dosa and went to that and. Um, we all of us had a real nice Christmas, but he only stays one or two days, and then he told Donna he had to get back and take care of the horses because he didn't trust anybody to take care of the horses right or to clean the pens right. He always had an excuse. When he was telling you these stories, did you did you believe him? Mm, no. Okay. I didn't. Okay. 
Did you do you ever remember ever? I, once again, I don't really know how close you and Donna were to really talk about these things, but did you and she or any of your other sisters and she ever talk about? Man, he sure does spend a lot of time at work and these all these weeks and only coming home once in a while. Was that a big conversation over over those years? Uh, no, my sisters, uh, don't really talk. They really didn't hang out with her much or talk to her as much as I did. Me and her go to lunch. And I asked her one time, I said, you know, and this is, you know, when he was first not coming home much, I said, do you, I go, you know, my dad's history. And she, I don't know what she did after she married him, but I said, do you think that he, is being truthful or faithful to you or uh and she told me yes hmm. okay she didn't have no worries then right and then we never really talked about it very much and then one time i asked her i said does it bother you when he only comes home for maybe thanksgiving one day or christmas one day and sometimes he don't even come then and she said, no, me and Justin are getting used to it. We don't even care if he's around half the time because when he's here, he just mopes around. That's how she put it to me. Okay. So that brings us to the next part of this, and we'll probably explain a lot of what we just talked about. Who is who is Mary Gillett, G-I-L-L-E-T-T? -T. Who is Mary Gillett? She is a lady friend of my dad's that he met in Anthony, New Mexico, when he was racing just right out of El Paso at Sunland Park uh, racetrack. And it's not in El Paso, but it's right out of El Paso. She was a waitress there, and he met her there, is what I was told, and that uh, he she told me that he asked her if she liked to dance and she told him yes and he said well maybe we we'll, can go out dancing sometime and so i guess they went out dancing and uh so they started seeing each other by what she said which she didn't tell me a whole lot but she told me that they had been seeing each other for 20 years and that when my dad would go from there to Albuquerque to race or to Hobbs, New Mexico to race. She they had a she had a camper or a little R V and she would take it to those places so he would have a place to stay. And she would be there. And she would get mm -hmm. a job at the restaurants and work while he trained and raced. So to put it simply, when when he was saying that he needed to be at Rio Doso Downs to tend to the horses and mm. spending all this time away from Donna, he was actually spending the time with Mary. Yes. Okay. Uh, what it, I gather. Uh, I, I figured it out that he had, if he'd been with her, like she says, for 20 years, his son was two years old when he started seeing Mary. Okay. And Donna believed him that he was staying in a tack room, and then he would tell her that he was staying with a, a, a guy friend, another trainer or a racehorse guy. And she believed him, I think. I mean, she never questioned it. She never questioned it to me. Mm-hmm. And she didn't drive, so she never would you know, have somebody take her up there to see what he's doing. Uh, one time, his sister lived in Redosa, and she, Donna and Justin, would go up there and see Dad, and they would stay a week with my dad's sister. And when my dad got done at the racetrack, he would come over to his sister's house and see Donna and his son. And then uh, he he might spend one night there, and then he would have to go back to the racetrack. And Donna never went to the racetrack no. to see what he was doing or not doing. But she found a note in his coat pocket from somebody saying, I'm fixing you supper. 
is what I was told, and that it was from a woman. But she never questioned him about it. Okay. Nothing was ever said about it. In okay, so how many during this time? And you, like you said, it was uh, his son was born in 1989. You say that uh, it was two years. He was two years old, so this would have been 91. So your father carried on this affair for 20 years before he disappeared in 2011. Uh huh. And he was married to Donna the whole time. Yes. But okay. He also was seeing other women. Okay. All right. Well, let's let's hold off on that just for now. We can maybe talk about that a little later. Let's just talk. Stick okay. to uh, Mary being that he was living with her. They in this RV, uh-huh. et cetera. It does seem like he was. She was the main one, the main mistress, I guess, yeah. over the over twenty years. So. We'll just keep yes. it at that. We don't want to name name after name after name because I'm, I'm sure the listeners okay. will get confused. And we're talking about a disappearance yeah. here. We're not trying to get into his private life. We're only going to talk about those people that were around him at the time of the disappearance. So okay. uh, how many people do you think of it? Now, you didn't know till much later, and we'll get into that. But at the time, between let's say 1991 and let's say 2005, how many people do you think knew that your dad was cheating on Donna with Mary. How many people? Probably, as far as people that I knew, mm-hmm. probably five or six. And one of them was Donna's best friend. She caught my dad with this lady. Uh, they, her and her husband were in Rio Dosa, and they went to a restaurant, and Dad's sitting there at a booth with another lady. Huh. And... This is my Donna's best friend that hauls her around everywhere. And she didn't say nothing to my dad, and he's seen her, and he didn't say nothing to her. So she knew a friend of my dad's, which was like a dad to me. He knew. Another male friend of my dad's knew. that, uh, And then my mom more or less knew because of one of my dad's male friends and my mom were real close and he told my mother that dad had a girlfriend. But nobody ever told and, Donna? Uh, no. Huh. Not even her best friend because she didn't want to hurt her. Wow. Okay. But she talked to dad. He called her and said, or she, he called her and told her that she needed to not say anything to Donna. He didn't say that, but he says, you know, it's my business, and, you know, you just need to stay out of my business. He didn't want her to tell Donna. Mm, of course. I'm sure not. <laughs> I'm sure yeah. not. And she didn't She didn't want to hurt her. Okay. Which she knew before I knew. I mean, she didn't know who mm. the lady was, but mm. she seen my dad with a woman, which I hadn't until later in. Mm-hmm. And let's be clear, Mary knew that Jack was married, correct? Yes, she did. I don't know if she knew he had any kids right away, like mm-hmm. when she first was with him. I don't know what year she found out he had kids, but she knew he was married. Okay. Because Donna would go to the, when my dad would win and Donna would be up at the Rio Dosa, Mary was there in the wind pictures with Donna and my half-brother. And she would be standing away from my dad, and Mary would be standing by my dad in these race pictures. But Donna thought, I think, that Mary was just part of the race play, you know, deal. I don't know. Okay. Okay. How did you find out that your father was having this long, long term uh, affair with Mary? How did you find out? Well, and when? And when, never, of course. And when? Um, Seven, two thousand and eight. Okay. Every time we would go, I would go to Redosa. Me and my sisters would get together and go to Redosa to see my dad. He always had us meet him at a restaurant. He would buy us lunch, supper, and we would visit and maybe go to a park and visit. And he would visit with grandkids that went. And then we said bye, and he'd go on his way. Never offered to go to his house. We didn't really know where he was staying. We never asked because he was so private about everything. We just knew that he was somewhere, and we all figured he was with a woman. But, you know, we just didn't want to pursue it in front of the grandkids and everything, so we just left it at that. And every time we would go 
or I would go to Rio Dosa and see him, I, I always met him at a restaurant or he'd meet me and my other sister at a restaurant. And so what was, what, the, what, was the, what was the thing that finally brought it out that the topic finally came up? And uh, Probably on Father's Day, I called him back in, I think it was probably, like I said, 2009. It was probably 2008, 2009. And I said, I told him, I said, Dad, I said, you know, I love you. I don't, you know, approve of your lifestyle and things that you've done, but you're my dad. I love you. And I said, I'm tired of meeting at a restaurant. I want to go to Rio Dosa and visit with you at the place where you live. I said, I know you got a girlfriend because I just know you do. I said, it's been told that you do. And I said, I'm tired of meeting you like that. I go, if you're going to stay with whoever it is, you know, I need to meet them. I want to meet them. I want to go where you live in. And so he told me that her name was Mary Gillett and that uh, they lived in an RV place and that she worked at the at a casino, the travel center. And he told me where he lived. So when I came to Rio Dosa, I could come by there and see him. And that's how I found out. Wow. Well. And did, would, did, at that point, did you find out it had been going on for, let's say it was 2008. Did you, did he tell you at that time it had been going on for 17 years? No, he didn't tell me nothing like that. Oh. After my dad went missing and I questioned her, she told me it had been that long. Okay. And then she also told the police it had been that long. Okay. He never told me how long he'd been seeing her. And I didn't ask. In my mind, I figured he'd probably been with her for a while because he's been, you know, living. He hadn't been home in a long time. Right. Okay, so put this in a capsule. He gets married uh, roughly 87, 88. Uh, the son is born in 1989. Uh, this affair seemingly begins in 1991, 92, and it continues the whole way up until he disappeared in November of 2011 and an entire time. He was also married to Donna, and Donna never yeah. suspected that your father had at least one steady woman on the side. If she did, she was very naive is all I can say. But I okay. think that in a sense she might have, but she didn't want to address it. Sure. When my dad was in El Paso. He was hurt. He, I'm, I'm not sure what year that was. I think it was the same year that he that I told him I wanted to know where he was living. He got hurt. A horse, one of the his horses, kicked him and shattered his leg and his knee. Oh my. Well, he didn't want, this, and he was hurt, and he didn't want Donna to come to I call it Anthony in Mexico, where he, to take care of him. He and she goes, "Hi, Jack," and he said because he was staying at one of his uh, uh, a Spanish guy's place and his wife, and they were taking care of him. And it was a guy that exercised my dad's horses for him and that he was being taken care of, and he didn't want her to have to leave Justin in, in her job, so he was being taken care of. So she never went. And what I found out later was because Mary was up there with the RV. Of he was staying there. Of of course. But Donna told me when I, when she, you know, while my dad's missing, and she told me that she kind of started thinking that something wasn't right when dad didn't want her to go to Anthony, New Mexico to take care of him. When he got hurt. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, let's, so we've talked about uh, this, and we're going to come back to this later. Obviously, Mary is going to play a role later, but let's just get back to the the generalities of your father's life and let's just move up to 2011 what was going on in his life he may, disappeared in november but that year the way you look at it of course now 2011 you knew that he had uh, mary um uh you know as a, as a girlfriend on the side but what else was going on in his life would you say that his life was going well poorly uh what was he saying to you the times that you would see him or talk to him it was going poorly. Uh, he was, once he got back to Rio Dosa, he had to rec recuperate 
after they put pins and rods in his leg and he couldn't leave uh, the RV. And uh, he was very depressed about that because he's used to going and doing. And he said, it, you know, he's tired of watching four walls. Mary would go to work. And uh, he had told me that he was, you know, just tired of watching four walls and he needed to get out. Uh, well, let me take that back. That was before 2011. Now, during 2011, he was building uh, porches for people that lived in the RV place. They would pay him to take care of stuff for them. He seemed to enjoy that. He t he went around and showed me all the uh, nice decks that he had built for people, and he seemed to like that. But I know that in July of 2011, Mary and him had been fighting quite a bit. Okay. And when I went to see him in July, um, he didn't say anything to me then, but he was really emotional. He he took me and my other sister to eat, and he seemed to, like, have tears in his eyes a lot. He never, you know, cried, but he just seemed like he was distanced from us, like something was on his mind. And uh, so he seemed depressed to me in a sort, but he, he didn't want to talk about anything. Mm -hmm. He told us a few jokes, and and uh, then we uh, followed him to his RV. No, we didn't go to his RV then. We had went to it and met him there, and we took him with us to the restaurant. Mary was working, so my sister didn't get to meet her. I was the only one that had met her. And he just seemed distanced, uh, like he was depressed about something or something was going on with him in his mind. He really couldn't, you know, be like he usually was with us. I noticed that, and and uh, he was just real distant. And then I talked to him. I went up and seen him in August, and he seemed a little more relaxed and more happier, or, you know, more jolly acting. And then, and I talked to him in October, and he had told me Mary had got a facelift and that she didn't do it for him, he said laughingly, and that um, she was spending money right and left that they didn't have to spend, and it was keeping, it was upsetting him. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, she works, you know, works, but he, he, really didn't have a comeback with that. He just said that they were having some problems, but he didn't tell me anything else about it, about the problems or what went on or any of that. Right, and we have to remember that this, even though you eventually found out the about Mary eventually, this was still something that uh, at least, as far as we can tell, Donna, his wife, still was in the dark. So it wasn't like it was... Yeah. You know, totally out there, and you know, uh, you know, everybody, yeah. you know, was going to be able to uh, talk to him about all that was going on because he was, uh, frankly, keeping it a secret. Still, kinda. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, he was keeping it a secret to a sense, but everybody in Rio Dosa and the horse business thought him and Mary were married. Or they, the people that actually knew my dad from Artesia knew my dad was married to Donna. Mm -hmm. But they don't, didn't ever say anything to him or, you know, and he didn't hide it when he took her places. No. Sort of like maybe he wanted Donna to find out, but he didn't want to be the one to tell her. That could be. That's a, that's an interesting way to put it. Uh, my understand being that he was working on these porches in the RV park that his horse business was then not doing so well anymore in 2011. No, he he quit doing horses when he got hurt. He could no longer train mm. or race. Okay. So from I'm trying to think of the year it was he got hurt. I'm not sure what year that was. I'm I'm thinking it was back in you know, not 2009, 2008. From then on, he never tr uh, trained and raced anymore. Okay. Lived on Social Security and did odd jobs for people. And so he ended up selling his racehorses. Okay. 
in those times. So how many times would you say total that you saw him before he disappeared in 2011 during the course of that? You say, you said July, August, then August. October, I guess that's three times, but did you talk to him on the phone? I, I talked to him on the phone in October. I only I talked seen to him. him. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, in 2011, I seen him in March, and I seen him in July and August. Okay. And that's the last time I seen my dad. Okay. All right, it seems he had some... Okay, so that's that's how it was going. Didn't seem like uh, things were going too great for him. Maybe he's suffering from some depression. He has, of course, this uh, injury that it's taken him away from doing what he loved, which was working with horses. Kind of makes sense. Um, Mary seems like she was spending money they didn't have. She got this facelift. He maybe thinks it's because of. It sounds to maybe they they maybe she was the one that maybe was looking for another man. You know, when he says it wasn't for her, you know, it wasn't for him. Yes. Yeah. She, I found out later that she uh, did have a boyfriend that worked with her, that my dad caught her and him, uh, caught them together in a weird position. And mm. then uh, I found that, that out through one of my dad's friends. Dad never told me anything about that. Let's take – now, what's going to be hard uh, to maybe go through this with the disappearance is because – and I'm just going to tell the listeners this – is that the listeners should know that you didn't even find out about your father's disappearance until December, correct? Right. All right, sometime in December. And then when you finally found out, Mary told you – that, and we'll get into all the intricacies eventually – but she told you that the date was around no- November 15th. However, we're inclined to believe it was more like November 9th, given the phone records, which once again, we're going to talk about uh, eventually. But let's just concentrate, and we'll get into all that a little bit later. I just want the listeners to understand this because it's a little complex. What do you know, of course, from the phone records and everything about November 9th? And we'll talk about November 15th and these other dates later, but what you know, who did he talk to that day? What do those records show? Did people call him? Did he call anybody, etc.? What I could see by his records on the night is my dad had incoming call to him from Mary at three three o'clock in the afternoon, and then there was another one close to four. I assume he picked up because it was a minute or two, and one was two minutes, one was a minute. That morning, my dad had a call, an incoming call to him from his best friend, Roy, and that was about a five-minute call. And um, I'm thinking that's all that was going on that day of the ninth. Okay. And was Mary at work that day? Call. I assume she was. I don't know. Okay. I don't know if she was at work. I'm assuming she was, but she, my dad didn't. What I could see is that it, the calls on the night, the last calls that were on the night were incoming calls to my dad. When it says incoming, doesn't that mean somebody's calling him? That's right. That's correct. Okay. Okay. All right. So people were calling him, but that's going to his cell phone. So he could have been anywhere, conceivably. He could have been at home. He could have been somewhere exactly. else. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. All right. So, and I'm not sure whether those people would have known that or not, but there is proof that on no, at least November 9th that he was there. He was alive. Let's just put it out there. He was alive. He was talking to people who knew him. They were talking to him. They were hearing his voice. Okay. And what time is the last call? on his phone, the records that you have. Three something, correct? Three thirty one PM. Okay. And to your knowledge, and once again, you are the one that has the records, to your knowledge, his phone was never used after that. As as of my knowledge, no. I went through back in and even the police report had got a subpoena to get his uh, phone records, and they have the same stuff I have. There was no 
uh, nothing was called, nobody had called in or he hadn't called out after the ninth. I don't okay. understand exactly if the phone just wasn't working or what what happened then. Okay. Know. Okay. So nothing. No. No record of anything after the ninth. Okay. And you didn't get these records, of course, until you know well later. So mm-hmm. let's let's move up to this now, and this is how we have to jump around with this. How did you find out that your father was missing? And, and like I said, it's sometime in, in December, so like a month later is is when you finally found out. How did you find out? Well, I had sent my dad a Christmas card, and um, I would say it was around the 3rd of December, and uh, a package. And uh, probably a week later, it had returned a sender on the card, the package I didn't get back. And I thought, return to sender, what is going on? So, and I had tried calling my dad uh, from in, let's say, the third, second week of November, third week, and I never could get through to him. I never could get the phone to ring or it would just beep and be dead. And I didn't really think anything about it. I thought maybe he just didn't want to talk to anybody. So when this letter came back, my car said, return to sender. I called Mary. And I said, what is going on? Why is my mail being returned to me? Mm -hmm. She said, oh, your dad's not here anymore. He took off on the 15th, and I haven't heard from him since. Okay, let me just jump in here for a second just to remind the listeners so they can follow this. Your phone records, the phone records that you have and the police have, say that the last action on his phone was November 9th. But when you talked to her in December, once you got the package back, returned to sender, and you finally got her on her phone, she said that he left or whatever on November 15th, so six days after the last records that you have of his phone calls. Yes. So you have those phone records that say November 9th, but she tells you November 15th. So she's telling you that he took off. Well, does she say like she came home that day and he was gone? How does she explain it? She said she came home and they got into a verbal argument regarding purchases she had made she said dad made a comment about her going to be living in the poorhouse and he couldn't live like that anymore she stated to me he walked outside and she followed him and asked him what he was doing she said he told her he was leaving uh, where she would never find him she said he packed he packed things and left with nothing more to say to her so she yeah. says he took off. All right, that's what she says. Yes. Okay. That's what she says. Okay, and what uh, does she at this point when you're talking to her? This is for the first time since, of course, these packages came back. Uh, did she have anything mm-hmm. else to say about? Uh, of course, he lo- left in a car. Was the car missing? Anything else? Yes, yeah, she said he left in his little old rabbit he had. He left and he threw stuff in this little rabbit um, and left. Mm -hmm. And she asked him what he wanted to do with his stuff. And he says, get rid of the sons of bitches is how she told me. Hmm. During this conversation, did you ever ask her, why is it? Why do I have? Why do I have to find out my about my father? being gone a month after he left why didn't you call me why didn't you do something did that ever come up in that conversation or did it ever ever come up come up in any other conversation you've ever had with her yes i asked her because she would call me all the time when my dad wasn't feeling well and just tell me that he was having some problems breathing he had copd and she would call me uh, you know maybe once every months to let me know how my dad was if I didn't talk to him 
And she didn't want me telling him that she called me because she said he would be mad. Mm-hmm. And so I said, okay, well, if my dad left in, in the 15th and you hadn't heard from him yet, I said, why didn't you call and tell me and let me know so maybe I could find out some stuff or maybe where he went or something. And she says, well, he don't want to be found. And so you and your sisters just need to get on with your life and quit worrying about him. He doesn't want to be found. She said and that. That's all she said. Yes. When did she say that? Now that you, of course, you talked to her in mid-December for the first time. Did she say it at that time or did she say it at some later time? No, she told me that day I called her about why wow. that stuff was returned. Huh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's what she said. All right, so after you found out that you're, you hadn't heard from your father, of course, you had been trying to call him, and it was going, I think, straight to voicemail or, or something like that. Um, did you ever try during that month, did you ever try calling her to ask you why, to ask her why your father wasn't picking up the phone? You never did that in that preceding month? In November? Yeah, for let's say from November 15th. Let's just pick a date from November 15th to when uh, you finally no. did. To, you never no. tried to call her and say, hey, why is my dad not picking up his phone? No, because okay. my uh, I never did because dad had told me a lot of times that he didn't always answer his phone. He just mm-hmm. wasn't that much of a – he wasn't a talker. People would call him more than he called out. Okay. And during that time, did anybody, uh, like you said, he did have friends even on the day that November 9th, the last day of his phone records. Did any of those people in that month, once again, between, let's say, November 15th and December 15th, any of them call you and say, you know what? I've been having a hard time trying to reach your dad for some reason. Anybody in that month ever say anything to you about that? No, because they okay. didn't know me. Okay, they didn't know you. His okay. friends didn't know me. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Dad never talked about his kids to people. Okay. Had kids or. All right. Okay. So he takes off in this rabbit, and so did you follow? Did she, she? I guess she didn't even bother filing a police report, missing persons report, and we'll get into the things that no. she did do. Are you the one who filed the missing persons report? Yes, I am. Okay. Um, and, and you found it, filed it in, uh, Rio Doso, Rio Doso Downs? Yes, I did. Okay. And what'd the police do? Would they have to say, would, would they go out and talk to her or would they do? Well, they, uh, made a report and they had to fill out a bunch of paperwork and then they, uh, got information on, uh, where my dad's vehicle was and found out where it was towed but me and my sister had already found out all that stuff before they did and uh then uh they went and uh got permission from the guy that has the towing place to come look at the vehicle and they did some fingerprints and looked inside the vehicle to see if there might be something that concerned them. Okay. And uh, they seen a pair of coveralls that had red on it. They thought it might be blood. So they, you know, took that and as evidence. And a couple other things as evidence took pictures of the inside of the vehicle. That's all they did for a day or two. Okay. And then... Uh, they went and interviewed uh, dad's friends that lived at the RV that they could get a hold of. They went and talked to Mary, and they went and talked to uh, the people that owned the RV place. The police went and talked to people where Mary worked to try to get some information about Mary. And Mm -hmm. then they did some, uh, let's say a week, within days of that, maybe a week, they set up out there where dad's vehicle was located. They 
six and four wheelers out there. They had to get permission from the uh, Mescalero Indian tribe because it was on Indian land to search out there. Maybe thinking maybe dad wandered off. And out where out there is where? At the end of the Mountain Gog and uh, Mescalero, which is just not too far from Riodosa. It's You have to drive out of Riodosa and go up to the ma- end of the Mountain Gog. It's a big uh, hotel, restaurant, casino. Okay. And, and uh, so they took four wheelers. And rode up in there a little way, a little, you know, here and there on four wheelers, seeing if they might find something and didn't find anything. They searched around the lake. It has a big lake where people pay to fish. They searched around that, didn't see anything out of the ordinary. And uh, talked to the uh, guy, head guy of there. Uh, and we, I had already talked to him about maybe having some footage of back when uh, the car was probably brought into the parking mm-hmm. lot. And uh, he had told them and me and my sister that it had been so far back that they only keep footage for three or four days of the yeah. parking lot. All right, we so need to maybe you need to state this again. Where so this he's missing, the rabbit was missing. Where was the rabbit found? It was found on uh the third uh floor of the parking garage at the end of the mountain dodge. And that's where they found the rabbit. How did they how do you, they happen upon it? Well, uh they have security that you know, monitors the parking area, and it's an enclosed. I mean, it has a top on it and everything. And uh, I guess they had noticed it sitting there for two weeks, is what I gathered. Mm-hmm. And had been sitting there for two weeks. You know, never moved. And so they took the license plates down and found out who it belonged to and found out it belonged to Donna and Jack Hemby. So then they took the, uh, they told the uh, police department in uh, Rio Dosa Downs if they could get a hold of Donna or Jack or somebody. It had Donna's address in Artesia, and they wanted, uh, the inn wanted the, the sheriff's department to send Donna a note that, this vehicle had been sitting here this long and they wanted to know what she wanted to do with it, right. with anything, you know, what she wanted to do or if she knew it was sitting there. So um, the sheriff in Artesia put a note on Donna's door who told me and Donna never responded to it because she was in Idaho. Her mom had passed away and she wasn't, she was in Idaho at her mom's uh, funeral and stuff. So she wasn't home right when the letter was put on her door to okay. do anything about it. Okay. So uh, so the inn of the Mountain Gods called the towing place, and they came and towed it. And when, what time do you, and we know that, of course, you've already detailed how they kind of processed it for anything, but what day do you think it was that it got towed? Uh, I have the deal right here. It was on the 8th of December. So if we're to believe that his last day at the house was November 9th, even though she says it's the 15th, but November 9th, it sat there for a good month. Yep. Okay. Well, they uh, had, you know, been watching it, but they didn't have the right, you know, they couldn't tell me the exact date that they know it was brought in there. But that they had been watching it for a good two weeks, maybe more, and it never would move. It never Mm -hmm. went anywhere. So they thought, something's not right. Right. Of course. But there was a little window broke. Uh, This this little car had like your main window, uh, driver's window, and then a little window. How the older model used to have. Mm -hmm. That was broke, and they they told uh, the towing company told me the ignition was broke. So I don't know if somebody tried to break into the car while it was sitting there because Dad's friend told me that 
that window was not broke when Dad was driving it. He would take it to keep the battery uh, up on the little car. Mm-hmm. He didn't drive that car. But he said the window was not broke and the ignition was not broke. Her dad would have said something to him about that. Right. We have to establish that this was not a car that Jack usually drove. He had a pickup truck, and we'll talk about the pickup truck later. But uh, this was not a car that he usually drove. It usually just sat somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I do have to ask so you it this. Was towed on the eighth. It was towed on the eighth. Okay. On the eighth. Okay. I need to ask you this though. And this is something that comes to mind right now. Uh, Donna went to her mother's funeral in Idaho, and she was never concerned that Jack wasn't around to go with her. We also have to remember in late November there's Thanksgiving. You are you saying that Thanksgiving just rolled right by? And it doesn't seem Donna herself tried to get in contact with him. I would think that, uh, you know, with Thanksgiving, it's a prominent holiday, at least in the United States, that if he's not around, she would have called somebody. But she never called you that whole month saying, you know what, I've been trying to reach your dad and can't reach him. Do you know where he is? Even on Thanksgiving? No, because for the past, year on on the year before that thanksgiving dad never came home hmm. he never came back for the holidays his son went moved to fort worth and and uh dad never came back he he and i asked donna i said did dad ever call you know this was before any of this i said did you ever hear from dad and she says oh he sent me a hundred dollar check uh the first of november or she got it when she got back from her mom. She had a, you know, it was mailed to her. Uh, he had dated it, I think it was the 3rd or the 6th. Uh, I have it somewhere. But uh, that she never talked to him. She called and told him uh, something, and they just never talked. Okay. She never heard from him, and she just never called him either. And when, they, and when she did, they would kind of argue and... So she just kind of more or less blew him off, and okay, he blew her off. All right, so we have this vehicle. We have the rabbit that was discovered, but wasn't towed until December eighth. It was processed. Uh, it looks like it was broken into. Not sure what to make of that. Um, do you know if Mary's story? Of course, the police talked to her. Did her story that she told the police, does it match up with what she told you when you finally figured out your dad was missing? Did the two stories go together? Well, at first she told the police that she did tell them dad left on the 15th. Mm-hmm. And then that they got into that they were arguing and fighting and that he left and took off and... Uh, had thrown some things in the vehicle. She had told me that he left on the 15th and didn't take anything, clothes or anything. Okay. And I said, well, okay, why'd you, where is my dad's clothes? And she goes, well, a lot of his clothes were stained, and I gave them to Goodwill. So her story and, did change? Yes. Okay. To your knowledge... Was the story that she told the police about him leaving on the 15th, was that congruent with what she told you when you talked to her in December? Just No. It wasn't. Okay. Not All right. We will get into why uh, those cases, uh, the situations were different here in a bit. After it was towed, where was the rabbit stored or parked? Kind of where junky vehicles go, or or vehicles that are are wrecked, they they take them to pick them up, and they, if they're not salvageable, you know they stay there. Okay. That kind of place. Okay. And where was this place? How close was it to where Mary lived, the RV park? Uh, I would say across the highway. Down from the RV, about half a mile. Okay. And to your knowledge, did, uh, did Mary even know that the rabbit was there? Is what, what does she say? No. I asked her. Me and my sister came and talked to her when we found out the vehicle was towed. 
And I didn't know, you know, I wanted to know if she knew where the place was. And she told me, no, I've never heard of that. And I says, well, dad's vehicle was towed there. And she goes, oh, really? And I said, yes. Do you know where it's at? She says, no, I never heard of it. It was right there going to her home from Rio Del every time she came home from work. Mm. You cannot see it. it. I mean, you can see the sign. It has it right there, mm-hmm. the name of the place. But she claims that she had no idea that the rabbit was at the end of the gods, and she had no idea yeah, it that it was eventually towed right down the street from the RV where she and your father, Jack, lived. Exactly. Okay. She- said she didn't okay and where is the car now what happened to the car uh well from the time they got it till the time we saw my dad missing uh three to five hundred dollars was owed at the towing place for storing it there and uh so i got a hold of donna and i says you know the guy said that he would clear the bill if you signed over the title to him. Mm-hmm. And she goes, well, I don't need that for nothing. It was old and it leaked diesel and, you know, it was just old and she didn't drive. So she uh, sat him the uh, a, a, a signature giving him permission to have the vehicle and then she sent him the title. Okay. So where the where the car was being uh, stored after it got towed, the towing company got possession of the car. Yes. Okay. I was going to tell you before that, uh, in the police records that I have, they said that they took the car to uh, some police deal bay or something to have it fingerprinted. And some stuff done on it. And then it was taken back to the uh, wrecking yard. Okay. And but the guy but the guy owned it by then by then, so he gave him permission to take the vehicle. Okay. And was anything you said there was you said there was uh, some things, but nothing in the car has let. Obviously, the disappearance is still unsolved right now. Nothing has really pointed the police in any direction regarding the car. No. No. They don't. It had old tools. It had old stuff in it. Okay. They don't know who parked it there. Yeah. No. They don't know who parked it there. They don't know how long it was there. It could have been. Jack parked it there. Could have been somebody else parked it there. We don't know. Exactly. Okay. We've already talked about the phone records from that day of November 9th, not November 15th, but November 9th. Um, but in the days uh, up coming up to his disappearance or the, the ending of the phone records of when he was using his phone, um, you did find some unusual calls in there that you didn't know what the numbers were, right? Yes. Okay. As you look back on those records now, is there anything in there that points you in any particular direction as to his disappearance? No. I went through them and went through them and found names and asked his friends about the names, and they don't even know them. Mm-hmm. They don't okay. know any of the names except a, a, a couple people that he – there was some names in there that I've talked to the people. I called them, and mm-hmm. it was uh, individuals that Dad uh, did work for in the R- RV place, and Dad would call them to ask them something that they wanted done, or they would call him to check up on things that were done. But I, there was just – and there was a few phone calls that I didn't know who it was, right? But there wasn't enough of them to really pick out any certain number. Okay. And in fact, yeah. uh, you had sent the phone records to me, and between myself and a couple other people who assist with the program, we were able to get mm-hmm. uh, a few of those names and attach them to those phone numbers. But those were not people that you knew. No, and I've. 
and the names that we've came up with, I've asked his friends and uh, mm-hmm. that I've been able to get a hold of, and they have never heard of them. Okay. I don't know who they are. I do know that one of the names uh, that you gave me was a, a horse trainer. Uh, I looked him up, and he was, he is a horse trainer, and that he would go to Rio Dosa Down when, they, when the races were on. Mm-hmm. Uh, that he spent time in Rio Dosa, and he was a horse trainer and also a horse buyer. But he's the only one that I've actually found anything on, you know, as far as that. All right. The other people doesn't know him. And... Okay, so yeah. we have these phone records. Um, once you found out that your father was missing, and once you got these phone records, did, did you talk to any of his friends about how they were trying to call him and he wasn't picking up? Were any of them concerned? Has that topic ever come up with any of his friends? since he disappeared no the uh the people that i knew uh that i knew that called my dad uh, they hadn't tried calling him that i know of after dad went missing uh his friend that called dad that morning he ended up in uh, Lubbock, Texas with a brain aneurysm. And so he didn't try to call dad after that because he had left to go to um, Lubbock the next day. And he told me he was up there for a good three weeks, two to three mm. weeks. So he hadn't even tried to call dad because he wasn't in his state of, right state of mind. Right. They had left Rio Dosa to go back home to Texas because they only go during the summer and spring there, and and they hadn't tried calling Dad after the night. Okay, so what you're saying is nobody after the fact, when they found out that your dad was missing, even though if they didn't even know you that well or you've never talked to them at all in the last, once again, since 2011 – None of them have ever said, you know, I was trying to call your father that month and he wasn't picking up and it kind of made me suspicious. Did anybody ever tell you that in the last eight years? Mm-mm. No. Okay. Oh, yes, a lady did. Okay. A friend of my dad. Her son was the detective, the cop on my dad's case. Mm. Her name was Brenda. We, She did. Uh, I talked to her about my dad, and she did tell me that she tried calling him um, after, but it was after I told her he was missing. Okay. She tried calling him and didn't get an answer. Okay. Didn't think it was that suspicious, though. Yeah, she she sort of did. But, you know, she was another acquaintance of my dad's and she didn't want to cause any trouble they were just you know ended up being just good friends but she said the last time she had talked to my dad was maybe uh the end of october he was real uh upset about mary and this man and he didn't know what he was going to do about it and her birthday, this lady's birthday, was coming up, and he wanted to take her to lunch for her birthday. And she said then when November came, the first week of November, second week, she hadn't heard from him. She was kind of wondering, you know, well, what happened? And mm-hmm. uh, and she told me that, uh, you know, he never called her and said, well, I can't take you to, you know, lunch or whatever. And she says, I, I wonder what happened, and I tried calling him but never got an answer. Okay. But I don't see where on any records where where she had that they had recorded where she she had tried calling. Right. I don't know. Right, because your records end on the ninth. Yes. Okay. Let's talk about the phone itself. Uh, Mary though did something once. Maybe this is the reason we don't have any phone records after the ninth. Or what did she do? What did Mary do about? Uh, Jack's phone, or the, at least the account, what did she do? 
Well, I asked Mary if she had, if Dad took his phone to begin with, because I didn't think he did. And she said yes. And so, uh, you know, after I got my dad's records, I didn't see any more calls. Well, I have my dad's bills where he had paid his bill. And then I see a record of somebody paying my dad's bill uh, in the 20th of December. So I asked Mary, I said, somebody's paid my dad's last bill. And I said, you know, I was hoping maybe it was my dad. And she said, I don't, and I asked her, I said, did you pay my dad's bill? And she said, no. And so my sister even asked her, she called her from Pennsylvania and talked to her and said, you know, we're trying to find out, you know, it would really be helpful if we knew who paid my dad's bill. And she goes, well, it wasn't me. And I wish you'd quit asking me about it. Well, then when the police start questioning her, she confessed to them that she did pay my dad's bill. And then uh, they found out that my dad's phone was shot, shut off or turned off on the 12th. And so they asked her about that. And she says, no, it wasn't me. Well, then I got to searching and found out that a woman had had uh, had turned it off saying for seasonal reasons or something that it needed to be shut off. All right. So let me, so please, uh, let me line this up for the, the listeners, please. So we have her first claim that he left on the 15th, mm-hmm. but then you get the phone records and the phone records seemingly end on the 9th. And then you find out that she cut off his phone service on the 12th, which is three days before the day that she says he left. No, she had it cut off the 12th of December. 12th of December. Okay. All right. 12th of December. Okay. So not the 12th of November. Just wanted to be able to see. This is why we go over these things, because all you did was say the 12th, and I'm thinking November 12th. So December 12th. Okay. Uh Okay. Well, she he left. Maybe that does. Maybe that makes sense then. Maybe. Okay, but she denied it though. Her there was a discrepancy between what she told you about the phone and the paying of the bill, and then what she told the police. Yes, because I told the police that I had, you know, that I had the records of somebody paying the bill, and it was a woman, and so they thought, well, maybe they, it was her. Okay. So they knew she had told us girls that she didn't pay it. So they were going to ask her and find out if she was lying about it. Okay. So she came clean and told them yes. And then, um, so they asked her why I didn't. They asked her why she had it shut off when she was not on my dad's plan. She was not even, you know, verified to do that. And she says her reason was because he belittled her a lot and she and and that she didn't want his uh bill to come to her. She paid the bill because she didn't want the bill coming to her mail post office box. Which my dad mm-hmm. shared with her for eighteen years or twenty years. Right. And is that the reason that when you sent him that 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 package came back to you? Mm-hmm. Is because she yes. she totally cut him off of anything that that was connected to her, which was sh- also mm-hmm. the sharing of this post office box. Mm-hmm. Okay. Let's move on to this. Let's talk about the vehicle that your father usually drove, which was a pickup truck. What happened to it? What what year and what model was it? And what happened to it? Being that we know the rabbit ended up at the end of the God's Casino, what happened to the truck? Uh, I don't know the make and model. It was a white pickup truck. Okay. Um, and my dad drove it all the time to do anything he had to do in town, get wood to build the porches. He always used his truck when he was with doing horses. 
that more or less it was in her name, but that was more or less his truck. You know, he used it all the time. She didn't. She had two of her own vehicles, two of the vehicles she used. She never drove the pickup. So um, not too long after uh, I saw my dad missing, I told her I wasn't going to come up and get my dad's stuff that was left at the house. And she goes, well, I give me a few days because uh, I need to get it all gathered up and I need to put it, she put all of it in this pickup. So when I get to get up there to get my dad's stuff, it's all in the pickup. Me and my daughter have to get it all out of the pickup and put it in my vehicle. So after I did that, then we told the police about it. And um, so they went by and got the make and model, which I don't see that. I know I have it somewhere. And uh, so they had all that wrote down. Well, I guess a week after that, they told me that they had pulled over an Indian woman driving this pickup because the registration was off of it. I mean, the license plate mm-hmm. was removed. And so they seen, you know, they was like, they seen this vehicle with no registration. So they pulled this lady over and she tells them that she doesn't have a registration yet because she was just buying this pickup. And they go, well, who are you buying it from? And she told them Mary Gillett. And so I they I don't know if they did anything after that. Nothing that I can see has been said about it after that. They what I can see in the records, my, the police records, is they never asked Mary about who bought the truck or who was buying it or anything. Okay, so somehow your father's truck ended up being driven by someone else, and they're claiming that Mary sold the truck to her. Mm-hmm. To them. To them. Okay. That's why they didn't have her license plates yet. Right. Okay. Uh, do you know where the truck is now? Do, do you think that, of course, it's been eight years, but that, do you yeah. believe that that truck stayed in that person's possession? I don't know. Don't know. I have no idea. Okay. Mm-mm. Okay. So that was the explanation that she sold it, and we don't, you have no idea how much it was sold for, or anything like that. Mm-mm. No. Have okay. No idea. All right. Did Mary ever own up to selling? When you got to talk to her, did she ever own up to selling his truck to that woman who was end up who ended up driving it? No. Okay. Because I had after I followed him missing, she didn't want to talk to me anymore. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I suppose she, that makes sense. She didn't give me. Uh, when I went and got my got my dad's stuff and things that she told me and my daughter when we went to get my dad's thing. Uh. I just told her to quit lying to me about things, and she started crying. I said, you don't have to lie to me. We're trying to find out. I said, my dad is missing. If you haven't heard from him, nobody's heard from him. Something's wrong. And, you know, I thought she'd be concerned, and she kind of cried, and I said, just don't lie to me. That's how we're going to find out things. And then she just kept on lying. She said, okay, but then she turned around and told me another lie. Okay. Let's move on to this. And you, uh, after that, she wouldn't talk to me anymore. When the police started uh, interviewing her and wanting her to come down to the police department, she didn't. She wouldn't talk to me anymore. Okay, did she talk to the police? Yes, she. They did an interview with her, and uh, she went down there and talked to them, and then they wanted her to come in for another interview. And she wouldn't go. She told them she didn't have to. She had talked to a lawyer that was a friend of hers, and he told her that she didn't have to if they uh, weren't going to arrest her for anything, that she didn't have to. So she didn't. They wanted her to come down and do a voice recognition test, see if they could find some discrepancies in her voice of lying or something. And she deny or she said she couldn't do that because she was just too nervous and she knew she wouldn't pass it because she would just be too nervous jack's memorabilia what happened to it 
she told me and my sister that she took my dad's memorabilia to the place where she worked and gave it away or sold it. She says, I gave it away and sold some of it and gave it away. And I said, why would you not call me and and ask me if I wanted it? Or, you know, let us, his daughters, you know, want it. If you, if he said, give it away, give his stuff away, like he said, why didn't you call me to come get it? And she says, well, most of it, I bought him anyway. So I figured it was my, you know, it was mine. Mm-hmm. And some of it, you know, uh, some of it wasn't. It was stuff that this girls had given him for Christmas and things like that. But that was her, her reasoning on that. That she had taken it and sold it or gave it away at work. Okay. Did she not say that she auctioned some of it off? And what 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 was the result of looking into that? Uh, well, I asked her about my dad's belt buckle that he always wore because it was worth a lot of money, had big chunks of turquoise on it, and his dad gave him that when he was younger. He he, it was kind of transferred down from family. You know, my dad's dad and. And so uh, my dad always wore it. If he didn't wear it, it, I mean, all his pictures, he would have it on. And I asked her about it when I went to get my dad's things. I said, where's my dad's belt buckle? Because I asked her if he if he left with it. And she goes, oh, no, no. He, Your dad back in March put that belt buckle in a silent auction that was here, around here. So I checked into uh, any auctions that were going on around Rio Dosa. The police also checked into it. There was no silent auctions back in March of 2011. There was no auctions, silent auctions back in 2011, up until he went missing. Okay, so that seems to be some sort of discrepancy uh, as well, something between what she said and what the police and you were able to find out there was no corroboration of what you said, no support for it. No support. Okay. What about his guns that he owned? What happened to them? I don't know what happened to the uh, the one gun. Uh, and I didn't know that he had two guns. Uh, his friends that I've talked to that lived around there or stayed around there, uh, one of them uh and dad would go out and sight their guns in and he's told me dad never mentioned having two guns the only reason that i thought he had two guns was because donna told me that when dad first started staying at the tracks she gave him she had a a gun of some kind of pistol and she gave him her gun to you know to keep to, to be safe and uh I asked Dad's friends if they had the, uh, he had another gun, and they said no. The only gun he ever showed them or talked to them about was a thirty-eight snub nose pistol, a Smith and Wesson. And so uh, I got into checking that, and I found out that Mary had taken this gun down to this my dad's best friend and told him she didn't want it at her house. Okay. And she was going to give it to him. She didn't, ask, you know, call me and say, you know, do you want your dad's gun? She gave it to this Roy, my dad's friend. Okay. Just, there all the time. just to ask you straight out, uh, has that gun ever been checked to see if it was used not long before she gave it away? No, that I know of. And I told the police where it was, and they went and confiscated it and just put it in evidence log. I don't know if they, I don't see anything where they checked to see if it had been fired. Okay. All they did was pick it up and the ammo with it. Okay. Let's move on to this. The, their RV, um, you were in it before your father disappeared, and you were in it after your father disappeared. Anything unusual? Uh, after my dad disappeared, uh, it, before he disappeared, when I would go visit, there was a, uh, a little couch and a recliner in the little living room part. And, um, my dad sat in the recliner a lot when we were there visiting. 
And he did sit on the couch some because I'd sit in the recliner. Well, when I went back to get my dad's stuff, uh, she had replaced the couch and the recliner and had a, a two new chair recliners and no couch. And um, I noticed a piece of the paneling by where the old rec- recliner sit was a different color. It didn't match the rest of the paneling that I had seen in the RV before. All the color was uh, dark, and this was a white colored piece of paneling. And I said, hmm, I said, you know, that did you have a, you know, did you have to have a water leak or something? And she said, oh, yeah, I had to have that replaced. And then she told me that, she had the couch and the recliner hauled off because it smelled like my dad because he never would take a bath or a shower, okay. and it stunk. All right, so That's just to be just, so just to be clear on this, there was something that was different. That wasn't something you were just hallucinating or something. Just this was something that Mary no. admitted to that there was some paneling that was changed before he disappeared and then after he disappeared. No, the paneling uh, was changed after he disappeared. Right, right. And I went back to get, yes, yes. Right, so I, all I'm saying is that wasn't something you were imagining, That, but actually oh, Mary, no. did, Mary did tell you that there was a change. Yes. Okay, all right. And also uh, I noticed, um, or she said something about uh, she had bought a new mattress too, and – her, my dad were fighting about money issues. So, uh-huh. I'm like, okay. Uh, why would she, you know, go buy stuff if she thought dad was going to come back? And she also told the police she was scared of my dad. But that's, I don't know. Anyway, uh, she says, oh, yeah, and I bought a mattress too. I, I replaced the mattress. And so I said, well, okay. And she said, uh, she didn't say anything else about that. I told the police. They could not locate the chair and the couch, but they did locate the old mattress. And uh, the people that brought in the new mattress told them where it was. And so they went and looked at it. There was just a little spot of blood on it. And it was like where they said where my dad, like if he laid, it'd be like where your knee is. Mm-hmm. Well, it's a little spot is okay. all they could see on that yep. mattress. And she bought the mattress. I have the receipt from the place on the 12th of November. It was delivered to her on the 12th. So she bought that mattress before she says your father left. Dad went missing. Yes. Hmm. Okay. And that's when, when I found out when she bought the mattress, that's when they asked her. Well, you said he left on the 15th, and then she turned around and recanted her story and told the police that, oh, well, I think it was a few weeks, or or, uh, I think he left a a few days or weeks before the 15th. Okay. That's when she told the police that, because see, they had the mattress received, and so they asked her about it. Then she said, oh, well, maybe it wasn't the 15th, maybe it was sooner. Okay. Let's talk about, we've obviously, we've talked about uh, Mary quite a bit here. What did she eventually do? After all this, uh, the police came and talked to her. Of course, she gave all this memorabilia away. She turned off the phone, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What did she eventually do with her life? Well, I I found out from um, Dad's best friend. He told me just a week ago that... um, uh, after he got home from Texas, that he was standing out in his yard and he worked up at the end of the mountain gods when my dad's vehicle was found. And he said, uh, the Indians have a, a man, I don't know what they call him, that goes around and gets rid of evil spirits. He says, it, he goes into rooms up there and does his la 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 and burns this sage and and goes around and supposedly they believe in relieving evil spirits from your home. 
or house or business. And so he told me that when he got home, he was home about four days. He went outside and uh, he seen this same man that he seen at the end of the mountain gods over at Mary's house doing this voodoo, uh, whatever you want to call it stuff. Mm -hmm. And so he walked down there and he asked Mary, he said, what's what's he doing here? Because he knew him from seeing him at the inn all the time when he worked up there. He did, he was a yard keeper. He worked the grasses and uh, golf course and stuff like that. And he said, she told him she hired this guy to come to the trader to get rid of, to the army to get rid of these spirits. And what day was this? Mm -hmm. I don't know the date. He couldn't remember the exact date, but he says it was a. He got home uh, a, a week and a half after Dad went missing, and he says it was in that time frame. Okay. And he also told me that he seen this man that Dad had told him about that he caught Mary with. He seen this man's vehicle at her house a couple times, spending the night, or it stayed there all night. Or all right. And this would have been in November of 2011 or, or later? Uh, yes. So November. So uh, seemingly your father takes off and before long uh, she has some other guy staying at the RV with her. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, on and off. I don't know. On and off. Okay. Okay. Um, so she did she come and do the evil spirit thing? Right. So she talked to the police, but then she stopped talking to you. Uh, she wouldn't take a lie detector test or a stress test, anything like that. Did she eventually sell the RV and move away? Yes. I don't know who she sold the RV to, but she did. She sold it. Uh, I went up there probably 1st of January or right around January to ask her some more questions and they had the people at the rv place that uh, was, were there all the time told me that she sold it and told them she was moving to fort worth her brother or somebody supposedly lived in fort worth i don't know okay do you have any idea if she stuck with this guy that was around right after your your dad disappeared any ideas no no he he uh, he did come in for a stress test because the police he was the one my dad caught her with he worked out there with her and the police were you know curious as to maybe if something was going on they wanted to know if he had helped mary do anything or if he was involved in anything and so they went to uh, his business where he worked and uh, asked him if he would come in for a stress test, and he he did. He agreed. Okay. Do you know his name? Oh, you do know his name, though, but we're not going to say it on the program, but you do know his okay. name. Okay. Yes, I do. Okay. And have you ever personally talked to him? No, I have not. Okay. In your opinion, has Mary shown any concern for your dad since she moved out of the area? Has she ever called you? Has she ever asked anybody, to your knowledge, about the status of your dad's disappearance? No. Okay. Does she have any connection to where the rabbit was found? Is Mary, for example, did Mary work near where the rabbit was found? Is there any way, frankly, that she could have parked the, the car where it was eventually found? Yes. Uh, where it was found, she had, uh, she had worked there at one time, but she worked at a travel center, which is a restaurant and a casino, and it's owned by the same people. And they have a shuttle bus uh, that comes from both places to the other. In other words, uh, if people stay at the end of the Mountain Gods and they want to shuttle over to the travel center for the day, they have a shuttle bus that comes every, you know, I don't know, every few hours. And, and picks up people there, takes them to the other place, and then back and forth, vice versa. Okay. So there is a connection there. And once again, uh, was there any life insurance or anything? I know they weren't married, but is there any sort of life, life insurance or anything, to your knowledge, 
that your dad had that would have enticed Mary to do something to him, to your knowledge? No, not okay. to my knowledge. Okay. And I don't, uh, my dad was uh, a very simple man and he wouldn't go get insurance on himself. No. Okay. No, he wouldn't. <laughs> okay. I can tell you that for a fact. Okay. He just wouldn't. Now, you did say we talked about Mary and this guy that she seemingly had, and uh, it seems that maybe uh, Mary was, uh, you know, had a guy friend, uh, just like, of course, your father was, just to be honest, cheating on his wife. Mary might have been doing some things behind Jack's back, but you had said that uh, maybe uh he had some other women besides mary we're not going to mention any of their names but have you had an opportunity to talk to any of them since your father disappeared yes and what have they said uh the one lady um uh, she said that uh she had went out with that a few times uh but they were really good friends and i i've even seen her in some of my dad's winning pictures and that uh, they tried dating some while he was with Mary or something like that. And that um, she couldn't put up with my dad's temper. He was, huh. I mean, his jealousy temper. And so she just told him that, that, that it wasn't going to work like that. And she uh, couldn't see him like that. That they just, she just wanted to stay friends with him, not date him or have any kind of relationship like that because she told me that uh, she, where she worked that uh, she was around a lot of people and they would hug her and stuff and I know where she worked but mm -hmm. she said that dad if he would come in he would get real mad just from her hugging people <laughs> and be real jealous about it and she couldn't put up with that okay and do you so, they just they just remained friends, and that's the one that had that Dad was going to take to lunch. That he never made it. On okay. Birthday. Okay. Do any of them any of them ever offered? And I'm not going to give you, you. We don't want to talk about what their opinions are, but have they ever given you an opinion on what they think happened to your father? Uh. Well, uh, let me, let me, let's go back and I'll tell you this other lady. Uh, and I found out that she had seen my dad and I, and I don't know if it was when he was with Mary or before Mary, but she lived, uh, in Amagordo and she was a friend of mine on Facebook. And when she found out she used to have horses, well, she got a hold of me and she said what is going on with your dad so i told her and so uh and she knew about mary and uh so she started telling me places that she knew dad would go you know or things like that and then she and she gave me her opinion but she just she just told me that uh she don't think that dad or she said dad in her opinion, would not leave the way he had left. Everything yeah. left there that she would not have, that he would not have left all his belongings there and she doesn't feel and would not have notified some friends or family or something. Okay. So these women did know that your father was missing, um, but uh, they might have an, their own opinions on it, but they don't know much more about the disappearance than you do. And in fact, you said that no. one of them was supposed to meet your father, and of course, he never did meet her because he disappeared. Exactly. And her son was the one that was the police on my dad's case. Right. We okay. found that out. Okay. She uh, did tell me that. She did tell me that when her and dad, every now and then, they would just go have lunch together at a at a park or somewhere and she did tell me that one time dad told her they were just talking in general i don't know what brought the conversation up but she did tell me that dad told her that it would be easy for somebody to disappear and not, nobody find them okay she said dad told her that 
And she said, well, Jack, you know, how, how would you, you know, but she said he never elaborated. He just said, it's not, he said, it's not that hard. It would, it's not hard. Wouldn't be hard for somebody to just get up and leave and disappear. That's how I put it to her. And she never really, you know, I never talked about it anymore after that. Okay. So when he went missing and I talked to her afterwards, when I saw him missing, she says, I wish I would have collaborated with him more about it, you know, to maybe find out what he was talking about. But she didn't. Let's move on to this. If we haven't, uh, we're going to move to something else. Because I'm sure right at this point, a lot of listeners are thinking, well, you know, Mary certainly does seem suspicious and everything, but we need to move to a totally different direction. And that has to do with horse racing at Rio Doso Downs. Um, there was corruption going on at the track. Um, by the time the listeners hear our interview, I'm going to be posting some articles about what was going on there. Um, did your father know about this? And you've told me that he was somewhat outspoken about what was going on there. Why don't you tell the listeners about that? Well, when I would talk to my dad about the racetrack, he told me that uh, he said there's things that are going on at the racetrack that people don't know about. And he says, I don't agree with it. I think it's wrong. And I think that it needs to be told, you know, that somebody needs to know what's going on. And I said, well, Dad, what is it? And he said, you know, I really don't even want to discuss it with you. And I said, well, does it have to do with drugs or drug cartel or the man that owns the racetrack? And he said, all the above is how he put it. Huh. And uh, that's all he would, and he said he didn't, uh, and my dad and the man that more or less runs the Adosa owns the racetrack they did not get along because my dad called him a crook he said he was a crook and he would write about him in letters to the editor my dad was very boisterous in letters to the editor okay he would write about the he would write about the racetrack out of El Paso like he actually got people mad my dad was on the board and the guys that I had talked to there actually didn't have anything nice to say about my dad because he was making it known that illegal stuff was going on, even the horses being shot up with stuff and that he didn't approve of it. And they were mad at my dad because I said he shouldn't be talking so much. Mm. But they, that's all I would say. Do you know if your father was ever threatened speaking out regarding this? Uh, any, in anything like that? No. No idea? I did talk to a lady uh, after my dad went missing a few months, maybe back in March of that year. I had a forum out of Rio Dosa or a forum uh, that was about, you know, talking about my dad, people that knew my dad. And I would get on there and read it. And I would ask some questions. And some of the times I would get answers, but there was a lady on there that said she trained with my dad, that they shared the same stalls and things. Well, she was threatened. She was threatened. She didn't say by who, but it was somebody in Rio Dosa. And her opinion, she was threatened, and her opinion on my dad's missing was she doesn't think he left on his own. She, That's her opinion. She says, I was threatened. And I knew as much as he did, so I don't know why he, if he was threatened also, she did not know about it. But she says she was threatened. She had to move from there. Mm -hmm. And she's the only one that really said anything to me about anything about that. So there was, uh, there was corruption going on at the track. Your father was outspoken mm -hmm. about it. This other woman who felt like she, the key did, was was threatened. So it's possible that your father was threatened, and he just didn't tell anybody, didn't tell you, didn't want you to worry. Exactly, because Dad didn't even like talking to me about his medical problems. He always changed the subject. He didn't want the okay. subject on himself. Okay. And it should be known since 2011, since this disappearance, Rio Doso Downs has been. Uh, there's been a lot of articles on this, people charged and convicted on a lot of things that were going on there involving Mexican cartels being in the horse race business. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Okay, let's uh, move back to a one we haven't talked about in a while, and that is Donna. What did she have to say about all this when she discovered that her husband, who was hardly ever home, was missing? Well, uh, I had to call her the day I had sealed papers out in Red Dosa to saw my dad missing because I didn't remember which leg it was he hurt. So, uh, and then I needed to call her to see if there was any distinguishing marks, you know, tattoos, which my dad didn't have tattoos, but, you know, something that she might know that I needed to put in the report. Uh, She did not know which leg because she wasn't around dad enough to really pay any attention, she said. And so... You know, I let it go after that. I asked Mary. Mary couldn't remember. She goes, well, I rubbed it. And Dr. I couldn't remember which day it was. So I um, didn't talk to Donna anymore after that till I got home. And uh, she asked me where Dad was living. And I said, well, he was living in an RV with another person and she goes man or woman and I said woman and she looked at me in shock I mean she had this look on her face like she was totally shocked (laughs) Hmm. Uh, and did you have to tell I guess you had to tell her how long it was going on Mm, I don't know if I told her then or not okay she she was in shock and she didn't ask me a whole lot of questions that day or that week. And uh, the more that got interviewed and done, then Donna started calling the police department department and asking them questions. But I don't know if Donna ever really found out how long he'd been seeing Mary. I gave her all my dad's horse uh, books is winning pictures and stuff and she didn't want them she wanted me to have them and uh, it had pictures in it of Mary and a couple other women (laughs) in it Mm -hmm. and Donna was in them and she just didn't I didn't point them out to her I she just said she didn't want the pictures she didn't ask me which one was Mary or any of that she didn't want to know didn't want to see what she looked like she just and I think she asked me later on, you know, if I knew how long Dad had been seeing Mary, and I just told her for quite a while. Because huh. I'm going by what Mary has said. Mm-hmm. I don't know. You right. Know. Right. I don't know. Uh, so right. I didn't feel it was my place to say because I don't know, you know. I mean, I could tell her 20 years, 15 years, 10 years, but if I don't have you know, know exactly. I hate to say. Sure. And I didn't want to hurt her or my half brother. Right. We can't forget that uh, Jack had a son with Donna. Uh, how did he react to this? And, had another, uh, and had, had another son. Yeah, by the lady that he he had another son. I have two half brothers. Right. right, but the son that the he had with brother. Donna. The son that he had with Donna, how did he react to finding out that his father was cheating on his mother for at least some time? Well, I don't think she told him till after, uh, I mean, he found out dad was missing first. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Donna told him probably a month after, you know, we were doing all the missing stuff on dad that I don't know if Justin asked her where dad was missing, you know, who he was with or what, but she told him that uh, he had been living with a lady in Redosa. And I don't know his reaction. I know that Justin and my dad didn't have a very close relationship and dad was never around. So I think Justin, more or less, dad was like gone to him, you know, like already out of his life. He didn't care if he seen him, let's put it that way. Right. Okay. He never, you know, mentioned dad to me when we'd talk or I mentioned dad and he wouldn't, 
want to talk about him. He uh, said he was never around for me when I was growing up. And I said, well, he wasn't around for us girls much either, you know. But we still loved him, and he just didn't really carry on any conversation about it. He was yeah. hurt for his mother. Of course. Are Donna and Jack still married legally? Yes. Yes. They are. And would you say that she has done, uh, Donna has done very much regarding Jack's disappearance, or would you say that you've done more, or have you worked together? How would you explain it? No, I've done most everything. Everything that's been done is by me or my sisters, a couple of my sisters, and we would tell Donna what was done. And then she would call the police department maybe. I don't know if she's even called them in the last four or five years, but she, at first she was calling and asking if they had any new leads or, you know, if they've any sightings and stuff like that, if the case was still open. Uh, but that's about all that she has done. Okay. So you've been doing most of the work on this. What's this been like for you for the last, of course, it's going to be, it's been uh, seven and a half years. It'll be eight years in November. Uh, what's this been like for you? Well, the first few years it went by fast because I was searching and studying and searching and in denial and checked nursing homes funeral homes and so it was kind of a blur but the past few years it it's like sunk into me that you know he probably isn't going to come back and and i just need to get on with my life <laughs> it's kind of how i feel about it i mean if i can find any more information out of, about it it would be great i would be grateful for it and i you know look forward to it but I ha I can't dwell on it all the rest of the years. Mm -hmm. I just can't do it for my own uh, benefit. And I don't go to Rio Dosa much any, like I used to. And uh, the reason I don't is because when I go up there, I feel nauseated. I feel like my dad could be laying somewhere dead out in the wilderness. I'm sure the animals would have got him by now if he was. But I, I have that, like, where is my dad? Do I need to go somewhere and look for him feeling? So mm -hmm. I can't go up there as much as I used to. It, it bothers me. I can't do it. So right. anyway, I just don't, just don't go. And uh, I just kind of put it in the back of my mind. I, every, you know, I'll have dreams that he's came back and I'm mad because he didn't let us know where he was. And, but I just try not to think about it all the time anymore like I used to. This has to be also difficult because not only are you searching for what happened to your father, but in the process you've had to, of course, release to the public, reveal to the public his yeah. private life. Uh, some yeah, things that he had been covering up for most people for a, a long time, and uh, that can't be easy either. No, it was embarrassing to me. It was, I mean, most people here that are my dad's relatives that, and that know us and knew my dad very well. And they, it wasn't like a shock to them that he had a girlfriend or other women because he's always been that way, even when him and my mom were you know, married and we lived here. So that didn't, I don't think, shock a lot of them, but people that Donna knew. Yeah. It was embarrassing to her. Of course. She, you know, it was more embarrassing to her because they knew she was married to Jack Hamby and that he was a horse trainer, blah, blah, blah. They didn't know any of the other stuff till it, till it came you out. know, and I don't even know to this day if they know about Mary. They know Dad's missing because I ran it in the papers hoping maybe Dad would see it, that I saw him missing. And that he would get a hold of me or something and say, I'm not missing you now. I just left him here. But I never heard nothing. No. No. When was the last time that you actually talked to Donna? Uh, 
probably about three months ago. She doesn't, uh, me and her were going to go to lunch and I always had something come up, so we hadn't never done it yet. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's the last time I've talked to her. Been going to call her, but haven't. She doesn't call me or call any of us girls. Okay. And where is Mary, to your knowledge? I know you haven't spoke to her in years, but where do you believe she is now? I think she, I, I don't know. I actually, I feel like she's in Fort Worth, but then a part of me thinks that she's in Amaguardo, New Mexico, because that's where her family was from. Okay. And once again, you haven't, when was the last time you actually spoke? Just to put it on the record. When was the last, on the phone, when was the last time you actually spoke to Mary? In December of 2011, when I asked her how come she didn't let me know dad left. Wow. So she, to oh, see. No, 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 no. Uh, that's wrong. The last time I have talked to Mary, uh, I, when I went and got my dad's stuff, about the it was probably the first of January, that week of January. Uh, I went and got all my dad's stuff that she had that he had left there, and uh, I talked to her then. And then uh, a month after that, I went up to talk to some of dad's friends, and she was working, so I went out there where she worked and to eat because she was a waitress at this restaurant at this travel center and uh, I thought she'd come over and talk to me and she kept avoiding me and then she did come over and say well I've been going to try to come over and talk a minute but I've just been so busy and that's the last time I've talked to her so it's been about seven years over seven Mm -hmm. years easily Mm -hmm. okay and she had my phone number yeah, I'm sure. Her, I'm sure does, she does. Okay. Do you have a website or web page, anything like that, set up uh, for your father's disappearance, Shelley? No, I, I have not. I need okay. to. I, I, you should do that. You should certainly do that. Get something set up on okay. Facebook that would certainly raise the profile of his disappearances. So when. People would search for it, you know. It'll appear in uh, a lot of places. That it, I, I I don't know how to go to go about doing that. Okay, well we can uh, we here at Unfound can help you probably set that up, or one of the listeners uh, will sh- certainly once they hear this episode, this interview, they will. I'm sure a few people will come forward to help you do that. I have no doubt in that because they've done it for former guests of the program who also didn't have pages or a group. Uh, set up on Facebook, okay. so I'm sure we can make that happen. So I do know that he is though is on uh, Charlie Project, which is good, and I know he's on Namus, which is is good as well. And of course, now that he's okay. you've been on Unfound, uh, it'll also be a lot easier for people to find out more information about your okay. father's disappearance. Um, any last words before we complete this interview, Shelley? Um. No, except that, you know, maybe somebody will come forward someday and say they had seen him or know something about his disappearance. And uh, I appreciate you for trying to get it out there after all these years because I haven't been able to get the police Mm. to do much more. I think it was because of my dad's age. He was an old man. It was a month later. They just didn't have, you know, it was like trying to find a needle in a haystack. Well, that's true. Uh, you know, I've about, we've covered about 130 cases on Unfound. And uh, of course, this is my program. I do all the interviews and, and everything. And this is a very complex case. And of course, what hurts this case is that you are now heading up everything. Didn't even find out he was missing until a month later. Whether we want to be suspicious about Mary or we want to take seriously that he said that, you know, somebody could just go off and disappear. Does it have something to do with these this these cartels that were at the at the, the racetrack? 
-hmm. no matter what the possibility is or the probability or the theory rumors what hurts this the most is that you didn't find out till a month later that's that's the big you know the the time factor is really hurts uh in this case for sure for sure if i would have known sooner i could have maybe found out more you know like who drove the car out there they would have had possible a yes. video or, or records or something but sure since it was so much you know later and me and my dad had a long a loving long distance relationship mm-hmm. that's how he was with all of us guys okay so he was very private because of his lifestyle and so we found out things either because he wanted to tell us or because I asked him. The other girls didn't. I did. So, and he didn't tell you a whole lot about it. Other, you know, he never really did. And Mary had three daughters. I, I wish I would have asked Dad what their names were, but I never did. And he never volunteered it. He just would answer it. My dad was not a talker. He would answer you when you'd ask him something. He'd answer you if it, you know, it was something he wanted to answer. Other than that, he did most of the talking. He didn't do much of the talking. Well, I, I can tell you, I've certainly enjoyed talking to you today, Shelly. It's a long interview with Thanks. over two hours, but uh, there's a lot to go through, especially considering uh, we had needed to spend probably more than we usually do on your uh, father's private life because I think it plays a vital role in this more than we probably do in a lot of the other cases that we've covered and then the time factor and a, a lot of these different things that you've been able to find out from the phone records uh, that's what leads to interviews being uh, this long but I do appreciate you being on this episode of Unfound okay thank you I appreciate you and that was my interview with Shelley Webb daughter of Jack Hemby I thank her for joining me and all of you on this episode. After this interview was conducted on Saturday, May 11th, 2019, I posted about it in the Unfound Podcast discussion group. A listener then volunteered to help Shelley set up a Facebook page for her father's disappearance. Please check it out at Missing Jack Hemby, Lost But Not Forgotten. The difficult part about covering a disappearance of a guy who was cheating on his wife is I suspect there will be people who will say if Jack was murdered, he got what he deserved, whether Jack was murdered due to his behavior or due to something else. And I'm not trying to create a straw man argument here. I've seen the memes and GIFs and everything else on the internet. Cheating is seen as one of the worst yet legal behaviors in Western civilization. As you would expect, I reject all of that. People who make poor choices and or commit crimes should suffer the consequences that we as a society, through laws, determine should be those penalties and consequences. Vigilanteism is anarchy and has no place in an orderly society. But that's the thing. In situations where a man is cheating, the mistress, in this case Mary, has a much higher chance of being murdered or disappearing than the married man himself. However, Mary's still around, and Jack isn't. And I can understand why many people will suspect her as the instigator in this case. She didn't let anybody know he took off. She got the disappearance date wrong. She stopped his cell phone service. She didn't know the rabbit was towed to a place right down the street. She was the last person Jack talked to on the phone. And I'm still not sure we know why they argued that day. Yet in looking at Jack's phone records going back several days, and Shelley did send them to me, Mary called him around the same time every day in the afternoon from work, with variations of only a few minutes. This is also true for November 9th, the last day Jack's phone was used. So I have to believe Mary was at work that day as well. Jack's phone use ceased after that call. The tough part? Mary admits she did see Jack the last day he was at home, when she got home from work. So I guess we must believe that Jack went without using his phone, no calls out, no calls in, between the call from Mary on November 9th, the whole way to the point where he took off after their fight, and even after that, despite his phone presumably being on after the call from Mary during that afternoon. 
it seems suspicious, but there were other days before November 9th where Jack didn't use his phone after 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. He just wasn't a real cell phone user. So Jack not using his phone very much after Mary's afternoon calls fits his usual pattern. So there's nothing suspicious in those records except them ending on November 9th. I'll also remind you of the corruption at the track. Many people knowing Jack was cheating on his wife, Donna, and Jack's alleged statement that he thought about disappearing. There are a lot of choices in this case other than Mary. However, I'm actually thinking about another relationship Jack had, one that we only touched upon for about 30 seconds during the interview. I wonder about the true state of it. I'll leave the rest of the theorizing up to you. And that's the program. If you found it informative, please go to the app that you use to listen to Unfound and give this podcast a nice review. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Densel, and you've been listening to Unfound.